All right, everybody, as promised, one of our favorite guys to talk to when it comes to college football and other stuff, too, and live <laughs> stuff. We talk about more than just football, believe it or not, from the SEC Network, former Florida star from walk-on, rags to riches, an unbelievable story, a Florida family, a guy that does an unbelievable job breaking down college football, our buddy, Chris Storing. CD, what's up, man? What's up, guys? Good to be back with you. And you're right, Jake. I think the better show would be the off-camera show. You know, the discussion yeah, about now we, football. That'd be more yeah, you, for that. you would really have some people dive down and figure out some talk about all <laughs> access. That'd be a totally yeah. different totally different style. But, you know, CD, we're almost to the halfway point of college football. It makes me want to throw up saying that because it feels like it just got here. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know maybe it's a, a low-hanging fruit question, but since we hadn't talked in a while, I wanted to ask you, are there some kind of overriding themes that you're getting from this year? Has, has anything stood out to you from a headline, maybe uh, from a story yeah. or narrative standpoint? I think the headline to me is kind of what we suspected in the preseason, and that's how competitive this conference is. You know, mm. we're talking about the, the floor elevating with uh, Vandy. I know everyone kind of celebrated going over the posted win total of two and a half games before September was over with, so they've exceeded expectations, and I think they'll probably end up winning at least a conference game or two this season. Um, but the, the really the middle of the pack, the talent level in the middle, um, and, and even watching this, this last month of the season, I think every team in the SEC, including Georgia, when we saw that game against Kent State, is susceptible. If they don't play their best game, if they're not focused, if they don't have great attention to detail, if they don't uh, protect the football, they could ultimately lose a game this year. So I really believe it's going to be difficult for any team in this conference to, to run the table. I know a lot of people project, and including my guy, Peter Burns, who sometimes just says things, I'm not sure if he believes it or not, but said that that uh, Georgia wouldn't even have a single-digit game this year. Uh, it was funny because uh, about six days after he said that, we're sitting there watching Kent State take Georgia to the fourth quarter. It's a 10-point game, and he's like, man, that, that could be out the window already. But uh, I just I think it's a very competitive league with a lot of really talented – I think it's competitive because – a lot of teams are talented, not because they're mediocre, which I think mm -hmm. will play out as the season. It's already played out with the out-of-conference schedule to some degree and the way it'll end up with the, the bowl season at the end of the year, too. Yeah, so if you had Georgia to cover and they didn't against Kent State, that was Peter Burns' fault. You can find exactly. him on Twitter and also yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, please let him know. <laughs> Blaine's mustached buddy, Peter Burns, yeah. over there. Uh, CD, you know, I, I do want to take it back to your alma mater for a second because, you know, it, it, it was it surprised me there was a big win over Utah and and it shocked me though that the lack of, of quarterback design run game that we were seeing out of Billy Napier and Anthony Richardson knowing the strengths of Anthony Richardson because to me obviously you're playing 11 on 11 against Tennessee it looked like there were more design runs I'm not talking about him keeping it on the zone read but actually quarterback design runs whether it be gap scheme whether it be zone scheme regardless of however you want to look at it and to me that seemed to not only help his wide receivers create a little separation which we haven't seen really all all year but it but it brought some semblance of balance and it looked like it made him comfortable did you kind of see the same thing yeah I, first and foremost i was very shocked with how much man coverage tennessee ended up playing unbelievable I, I, I would never play anthony richardson never or any turn other your running back quarterback yeah i mean it's all vision coverage so i was surprised by that but uh yeah i think you're right man and, and who knows what the reason was maybe it was mandated from the coaching staff given you know, Jack Miller's injury and that there wasn't a whole lot of depth behind Anthony. Maybe it was just his he hesitancy. A lot of people said he was banged up in that, that early hit against Kentucky. Uh, but whatever it was, he's better when he's not thinking. He's better when he's just playing and reacting. He's better when he's going back to his days as a, a middle school or high school player, just being the best athlete on the team. And you saw that in, in the game on Saturday, man. He just he, – he made plays. And I was surprised his – presence in the pocket the way he slid in the pocket the way that he stepped up with guys around him, the way that he scrambled to allow receivers to uncover those are the things yeah. that i like to see the most and i thought the game plan obviously it was ultra aggressive with the desire to to, to try to score as many points as possible go for it six times on fourth down hmm. but i also like the game plan of getting him outside the pocket i think he's most dangerous when he's outside you saw multiple bootlegs and rollouts where he can make some throws on the run where he's not thinking. And he also can put pressure on the defense with his ability to outflank the contain and be able to run. So I, I thought it was a great game plan. As I said on Saturday night, I don't celebrate. Florida doesn't celebrate moral victories. But I walked away from that game feeling even more encouraged than I had hmm. maybe after the Utah game in, in game number one. Yeah, well, as a defensive guy and, and as a guy that used to call plays on defense, nothing scares me more than when guys like Anthony Richardson or Jaden Daniels or a quarterback that is elusive like that 
when the play breaks down, yep. because that's typically when you see the big plays. It's not when they're diagnosed and cover two from the pocket. It's not when they're going through progression and progression. It's when they get outside and they start looking downfield. Anthony Richardson killed them on mm -hmm. broken down plays because it's hard to cover guys for a long time. And it's not, it's more drawn up in the dirt, even though it's not really drawn up once the play yeah. breaks down. Got some good matchups this weekend. I mean, you look Kentucky going to Ole Miss, AM going to Mississippi State, LSU is going to play a team that's attempting to play football in Auburn. Uh, and and then obviously Alabama and Arkansas. Which matchup, CD, are you looking forward to the most? Well, I've been hyping up Kentucky all year. You guys know that. I've been on mm. that Kentucky train for, for a while now. So, you know, I'm excited about these two teams matching up. I feel like of all the teams in this conference, maybe we know the least about these two. At least with, with yeah. Kentucky, we can hang our hats on the Florida win here in the swamp. But the, the Ole Miss schedule has not really given us much insight as to just how good the Rebels are. Uh, I know Kentucky struggled in Oxford traditionally in the last five times they've gone there. They've lost. I don't know what that means in terms of this year's matchup, but I do think that uh, people are undervaluing Kentucky right now. And, um, you know, I, I know that Chris Rodriguez doesn't block for himself, but I know that he can run through arm tackles that have brought other Kentucky backs down. I know that he can help in pass protection, which has created uh, pressure on, on uh, Will Levis. So, I, I, I like that game a lot because I think we'll find out a lot about those teams, and I'm, I'm still riding that Kentucky train. And I think maybe the, the low-key best game of the weekend might be the A&M Mississippi State game. Mm. And uh, I, I have no disrespect. I have nothing against A&M. I like Jimbo Fisher a lot. I like a lot of people there. I like their commitment to, to football. But I don't like watching their games very much. I don't like their offense. I mean, everything just looks so difficult for them, yeah. and it's, it's, there's no real ro rhythm or flow to it. Um, I've never looked at a, a box score and seen more deceiving stats than what I saw at that uh, Arkansas-Texas A&M game. I mean, I thought Arkansas dominated the game for the majority of the night with the, the only real wins coming in the red zone where Texas A&M's defense has been fantastic this year. And the turnover from KJ Jefferson fumbling that ball there, a 14 point swing. I, I truly yeah. believe if they go up 21 seven, it's not only a ball game, but could turn into a route. And uh, I guess credit the defense, credit, credit uh, Monty Richardson for making a play there. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're surviving and advancing. I don't know how quality these wins are, uh, <laughs> day, but they're, they're surviving. Yeah, it was it was ugly, and you know what they say about trends. They only matter in fashion and Twitter, David Cohn. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, let's talk about Tennessee. The question of the week at SEC Media Days was, which team in the SEC is the third best? And everyone had a different answer. Blaine, you were big on Tennessee from the start. Yes, sir. Tennessee volunteers are certainly making their case to be the third best team in the SEC. A big yeah. win over Florida. You've seen them up close and personal now. Uh, uh, an impressive win on the road at Pitt. They're going to get the Bulldogs and the Crimson Tide this season, Chris. Can the Volunteers hang in either one of those games? You know what? I, I think they can. I mean, they showed last year in Tuscaloosa that they could hang. And, um, you know, one of the trends that I'm looking at is the trend of Alabama going on the road. You know, we're going to see it this week against Arkansas. Again, I think the, that Vegas is overvaluing Alabama right now. If you look at uh, the, the games that Bryce Young has started on the road, over the last two years, with the uh, exception of that Mississippi State game, the other ones have all been three-point games. The other mm -hmm. ones have all come down uh, to, the, to the end. And really, it's been a lot of self-inflicted issues for Alabama. The penalties, the 15 penalties against Texas, mm -hmm. double-digit penalties against Texas A&M last year when they lost, double-digit penalties against Auburn, seven sacks that Auburn had of Bryce Young last year, uh, the six sacks that Texas A&M had. Like, these are things that are, are concerning to me. I think Tennessee definitely has a chance uh, against Alabama. And, and Georgia has shown themselves to be susceptible, uh, susceptible too. Like I, I look at that, that Georgia schedule, that streak of, of games from Florida in Jacksonville uh, to Tennessee to Mississippi State to Kentucky. I, I'm not surprised that they lose one of those games. I've, I've said it's going to be the November 19th game in Lexington with the cumulative effect of those previous three games coming into play. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if Tennessee maybe got them or at least uh, gave them a game. Yeah, no uh, doubt. Yeah, go ahead, Blaine. Chris, I love to hear you say that. I did have Tennessee as my third best team in the SEC, which is clutch. But, CD, I want to ask you something. It's kind of a program we really don't talk about enough on this show, I think. 
And that's the Missouri Tigers, all right? <laughs> Coach Drink, you lose a game like that. You miss a field goal. You fumble the ball into the end zone. You, there's only a certain amount of things you can say to guys that really get yeah. them back going. And surprise, surprise, you go play Georgia next weekend. What do you say? What do you think as a head coach you would say to those guys just to kind of get them back ready, kind of to get them ready to go and to go play the best team in the nation? Yeah, it's funny. And, Jake, I'm sorry, but I, I feel – I, I like I've come to like Brian Harson, but I, I feel like he's going to a gunfight with like a toothbrush or something, man. It's just yeah, like well, you don't bring in anybody on the, from the portal on the offensive line or at quarterback. It's 2022, dog. You know the weaknesses. True. Go make a move. Yeah, I mean you're right about that. Uh, I just I, I they don't have the talent. I mean it, mm-hmm. it was embarrassing the talent discrepancy between Penn State and and Auburn. Uh, the lines of scrimmage. These are not Auburn type lines of scrimmages that I remember yeah. from my days as a kid or as a, a player, but, um, you know, I, I look at, um, what are we talking about? Oh, Missouri. I look yeah. At, yeah, exactly. That's exactly yeah. Right, <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I get distracted by this Auburn rant, but, um, I look at Missouri, you know, they were down 14, nothing, man. They come roaring back and, and tie it up the final three quarters. They played great defense. Um, they made plays down the stretch to get into to field goal range for me. at the end. They, they, they get the ball back at about the, their own 30. They go right down the field. They hit a big pass play down the sideline. They did everything they needed to do to win. Unfortunately, they did everything they needed to, to do to lose. Like, I've never seen a team try harder or do more things to lose a game than what they did. The missed field goal, the offsides on the, 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 uh, the field goal attempt. Uh, they gave Auburn yeah. another chance. The fumble going into the end zone. Like, these are all things that you can point to and say, look, guys, we're right there. We went into a hostile environment. We came down from two touchdowns. We battled to the end. We just didn't make the plays, and uh, we've got to find a way to to, uh, to to make those plays to secure a victory because the margin for error is very small in the SEC. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I know Georgia was head over heels a couple of weeks ago, especially when the season started when they just drummed Oregon. You saw Kent State score 22 points against them and some weaknesses. Is there a team? If you, I know they go Kentucky on the road. I had them losing that game. What game do you think – if Georgia drops one, what game will it be? It's the, it's the November 19th game. Yeah. I mean, that's the – it's that it's the again the cumulative effect of having to play those four games in a row, and I can tell you myself from having played in the SEC, like it catches up with you. Not only the physical beating, but the mental drain that it takes every single week to to get up and play your best and and have to to refill the tank. So I, I honestly believe. Could you imagine like both of those teams being undefeated, having a chance to to host that game with something on the line there in Lexington? What that environment will be like? I mean, that last year we saw. Florida and LSU, you know, have to go to, to Lexington and back-to-back weekends and maybe the, the two best environments of the year. I just I, I hope for the Kentucky fans that they get a chance to experience that. And I think sometimes being in close games like they were, you know, I know from the score standpoint it looks a little closer, but, you know, Kentucky, they made some plays. They hung in there last year, and, and, and two years ago it was, was relatively close. Like getting – being close sometimes is part of the progression to getting over the hurdle. So I just – I think all of the – the, the confluence of events this year is going to give Kentucky an opportunity to upset Georgia. I just, I feel that way. I said it when we were all in media days and I'm going to, I'm going to stick to it till I, till I see otherwise. Hey, you get, you got to tell our buddy Takia spikes, uh, our good friend that I uh, don't see South Carolina beating Georgia. You never know. You never know. <laughs> you know what? Hey, Jake, we'll give him a pass. He hasn't been in, in this league the last few years. He's been out <laughs> covering NFL football. Like uh, I think in all seriousness, it's funny to me, to sit next to Benjamin Watson this year after being with him last year. Yeah. Last year was his first year on the desk with us. It just takes a while to get up to speed with all the storylines and the names mm-hmm. and the themes. Like, so I, I think a, a year doing what we're doing this year, he won't be making those crazy predictions about South Carolina <laughs> beating Georgia anymore. Yeah, well, no, it's, uh, it's funny. We caught up with him at SEC Media Days, and we're talking about that. I think he's been a fantastic ad for you guys. I mean, he, he hit the ground running, uh, had a great conversation with him at SEC Media Days, and he's definitely a guy I don't want to piss off, so probably don't no. tell him that, CD. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if he's going to catch this episode. Cone, you got anything else? Yeah. Hey, hey, Chris, after four weeks of football, which non-SEC team has the best chance to win the national championship? I don't watch non-SEC games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, that's why, that's oh, why you might have the best perspective on it, Good honestly. answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is funny, though. Like, the, the way we are consumed on Saturdays in the studio, I mean, that, that, that five-game window at night, mm-hmm. 7 o'clock on, I mean, just it's tough to watch all the games. We do have them on. And, and obviously, I've been impressed with Ohio State. I mean, you know, they look like they're pretty strong again at this point. Um, 
I'm not buying the USC hype. Uh, certainly, I think that was dispelled a little bit with that Oregon State uh, close one the other night. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't. Clemson is overvalued right now. Um, you know, I, I think it. Uh, until I see Michigan do it again, maybe I'm a little skeptical of them mm. as well. So I, I probably would go Ohio State on that one. Yep. Like yeah, no, I, I'm with you on that. They have the cats that can run with them. But CD, speaking about running, guy that could run uh, some pretty good routes as well. Uh, appreciate you joining us, my friend. Need to get you back on here. I know it's the busiest time of year for both of us, but we're always very appreciative when you take some time out. I thought you were going to say running at the bars, man. We can run there too, man. I'm, yeah. Look, I'm, uh, look, look. We're we're not talking about overtime yet. We're just talking yeah, about we're talking about uh, during during regulation yeah. there, CD. We'll we'll have an overtime one time. We'll we'll tell people what's up. That sounds good, man. Good to be with you guys. I love what y'all do and uh, continued success, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate Thank it. We'll talk Chris. about Blaine and all the See dirty ya. Shirley's he drinks at the bar. It's it's really cute. <laughs> but uh, no, we appreciate it, CD. Talk soon. Tell PB what's, right, up, what's up. I will. See you, Jake. Hey, everybody. Hope you enjoyed that content. If you did, go ahead and like and subscribe to our channel. We bring it every day, weekdays from 730 to 9 Eastern, Saturday special, Sunday recaps and NFL previews. And while you're at it, go ahead and turn that notification bell on so you know every time that we're going live. If you like sports without the politics, you'll love Crane & Company.